copious notes on how the process works. So an hour and a half passes, he thanks the supervisor, and he leaves to go to his office. But on the way to the office, he stopped at the payphone in the bank's lobby. He picked up the phone, and he called the wire transfer center, but this time he changed hats. He wasn't Stanley Rifkin, bank consultant. He was now Michael Hansen from the International Department. And the young lady, first question the young lady asked him was, what's your office number, sir? He looked down at his yellow pad, 286. Because he got that when he was doing the interviews. She goes, sir, may I get the code for the day? 4711. How may I help you? I'd like to transfer $10,200,000 to Waz Chod Handel's bank in Zurich, Switzerland through Irving Trust in New York. She goes, no problem, sir. Let me get your inter-office settlement number. Well, Stanley kind of scratched his head. He looked down at his pad. And nothing had come up about an inter-office settlement number. But instead of getting nervous and just giving up, he just said, well, let me call you right back. Stanley hangs up the phone, deposits another coin. He calls the international department. This time he changes hats again, and he's now George from the wire transfer center. So he asked the young man that answered the phone, what's your department's inter-office settlement number? Because we're trying to clear a transfer that was called in yesterday. The young man said, oh, no problem, it's 2478. Stanley thanked him very much called back the lady back in the wire transfer room and gave her the inter office settlement number of 2478. She said that the transfer of $10,200,000 would be completed in the next 24 to 48 hours. When Stanley hung up the phone, he, he was interviewed by the press after he was busted. He said he like, felt like he had won the lottery. So now $10 million on the way to Zurich Stanley had to figure a way to get it back into the United States. So what he did is he contacted a Russian diamond company that would take, take, the, diamond, uh, take the cash and convert it to diamonds. A week later, he lands in Zurich. The bank still had no idea they'd been ripped off. He does the diamond deal with this Russian diamond company, and now he's in his hotel room running his hands through 10 million dollars worth of diamonds. That must have felt pretty good, huh? The problem is, how does he get the diamonds back to the United States? Well, I guess he didn't choose to use FedEx, because that'd be a little bit suspicious. Probably they don't insure packages up to 10 million dollars these days, or back 20 years ago. So at London's Heathrow National International Airport, he purchased a money belt put the money belt on in the restroom and stuffed the diamonds in the money belt. And he was praying to God that United States Customs would not search him when he comes back into the country. So he, so he arrives at the LAX, Los Angeles International Airport. Customs asks him a few questions, and now he's back in the United States, free and clear, $10 million worth of diamonds. A few days later, he calls his lawyer, a guy named Gary Goodgame, and invites him to lunch at the Beverly Hills Hotel in Los Angeles. And over lunch, he reaches into his breast pocket, pulls out three large diamonds, puts them into an ashtray, and pushes them over to his attorney, and says, this is my gift for you. The attorney looks at these diamonds. He goes, Stanley, what is this, zirconian? He goes, those, oh, those are real diamonds. And then you know that grin you get on your face when you do something mischievous as a kid? And you just have to tell one of your buddies about it? Something sneaky? Well, Stanley, assuming he had attorney-client privilege, meaning when you talk to your attorney, it's confidential, he told his attorney how he defrauded the bank. That afternoon, the lawyer went straight to the FBI in Los Angeles and told them the same story. The FBI calls the bank. The bank says there's not, they're not aware of any fraud, but they'll investigate. <laughs> Eventually, Stanley became a fugitive because they caught up with him. I've been there and done that. It's not a fun thing to do, but that's a story for another day. So, the feds tracked down Stanley to a friend's house in San Diego, California. And around 6 a.m. one morning, 
boom, boom, boom on the front door of his friend's apartment. His friend opens the door. Well, how can I help you? Because he kind of jolted him out to sleep. Is Stanley Mark Rifkin here? No, I haven't seen him in years. Then one of the agents tells this guy the criminal and civil penalties for harboring a federal fugitive. All of a sudden, oh, Stanley's right in, oh, right in here. Come on in. So they found Stanley hiding in the back. They found the diamonds. And fortunately for the bank, the diamonds went up in value, so they made a profit. And then Stanley was let out on bail, pending his trial. So an un undercover FBI operative befriended Stanley, and they both conspired to do the same fraud against a different bank. Stanley didn't know it was undercover FBI, was arrested twice for the same crime. He ended up getting sentenced to eight years in federal custody, was released in three, and I don't know what Stanley is doing nowadays. But what Stanley did is he used the same skills and techniques that identity thieves and hackers use called the art of deception. And this is what my presentation is about today. It's about social engineering.